Over the last two videos, we've been comparing the life and teachings of Jesus and Muhammad. We've compared 22 points in total, and this is the result of that comparison. If you haven't watched the previous two videos yet, if you don't know how we got to this chart, then go back and do that now. Go back and watch those videos first, then return to this video later. This video has to be watched within the context of a thread, really. This is the third part of a trilogy of videos. In other words, the conclusions on this list are not wild or random assertions, and they're not merely my opinions either, but rather they have been reached through careful, direct quotations from the Bible, Quran, and Hadith, each faith's own source text. These are what the Bible, Quran, and Hadith actually record. This is what they actually say about the lives and teachings of Jesus and Muhammad. Now with that being said, in this video we are now going to offer some points based on what we've been learning so far. We're going to answer some questions and we're going to draw some conclusions to wrap up this sequence of videos. Where relevant, I will copy verses from the Quran and Hadith again in this video too, just to re-emphasize that I'm not unfairly representing Islam here, that isn't my intention, and that my main aim is just honesty and accuracy, straight talking about these two faiths, that's all. And remember, all the verses that you see in this video can be very easily fact-checked for accuracy if you are in any doubt about anything that you see in this video. Okay, let's go. Firstly, let's talk about this term, religion of peace, that's so often ascribed to Islam in the Western media. As you can see by what Muhammad commanded, Islam has never been a religion of peace, and it was never intended to be a religion of peace. And indeed, that term, religion of peace, had never been used to describe Islam until the 20th century. That's a very recent invention. For all the centuries before, Muslims knew what their religion was all about, and they owned it. They didn't apologize for it. Up until the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the classical understanding understanding of Islam was that Allah had empowered Muslims to go conquer the earth by the sword to establish dominance over it. This was the means by which Allah wanted them to reign over the world. No Muslim ever really had any qualms with this understanding. This is what Muhammad said and did. This is what he commanded from them. This is what they would go and do. And indeed, all throughout history, therefore, you see this consistent behavior from Islam. It's only from the 20th century that some have attempted to give Islam this makeover and put a new face on it and call it the religion of peace. The only problem is that the actual behavior has remained exactly the same. Muslims are flying planes into buildings, they're killing people in the streets, they're blowing up concert halls and train stations, they're trying to establish brutal caliphates in the Middle East. The essence of what Muhammad commanded is still there within the behavior of many Muslims, which leads to an almost satirical situation that as Muslims carry out all these atrocities, self-identifying as Muslims, many of them carrying Muhammad's name, shouting Allah's name and quoting Quranic passages, the Western media will still stand there with a straight face and say, it's the religion of peace. It's almost like a Monty Python sketch. It's so bizarre and surreal. Islam teaches peace. His teachings are good and peaceful. Anjum Chowdhury begs to differ. You can't say that uh, Islam is a religion of peace because Islam, it does not mean peace. Islam is, uh, it means it's Islam submission. So the Muslim is the one who submits. You know, there's a place for violence in Islam. There's a place for jihad in Islam. Until we accept that there is a Quranic foundation to what these Muslims are doing, and that it's not a mere twisting of the faith, as many would hope, but rather it's what Muhammad himself did and commanded, I don't think we can make progress here. We need to confront the reality of what Islam actually teaches, as horrifying as that may be. As the saying goes, if you get enough bad apples, at some point you have to entertain the idea that there's something wrong with the orchard. There's a violence problem in Islam for a very specific reason. Whenever there's an Islamic terrorist attack, I often see on social media people trying to pin the blame on religion as a whole. Ah, this is religion for you. Religion strikes again. Religion, they're all the same. Rather than saying it's Islam, which is what it is, they use this blanket term religion, as though all religion is equally culpable. Okay, it was maybe Islam this time, but next time it could equally be Christians doing this because they're all the same. As our chart shows, however, this is just lazy and it's wrong. Where Muhammad did teach fighting, subjugation, and killing, Jesus taught the complete opposite of those things. Jesus taught love of enemies and living at peace with one another. 
which is why you generally just don't get this violence problem within Christianity. We can also see from this chart that when Muslims are violent, they are in keeping with what Muhammad said, did and commanded. But if Christians were ever to be violent, they would be contravening what Jesus commanded of them. So even if we did find someone claiming to be a Christian, and committing atrocities, and let's face it, we hardly ever do, but let's say we did, we can categorically say that they are disobeying Jesus. Jesus would not be to blame for those events. His teaching would not be to blame. That person, in fact, would be an affront to Jesus, to what he said and did. To say that all religions are equally responsible for what Muslims do is like saying that all political ideologies are equally responsible for what the Nazis did. It's like saying that free democracies are just as culpable for things that the fascists do. It's just lazy, it's illiterate, and it's plain wrong. You know, this isn't the first time that I've made videos about Islam. There was one video in particular several years ago that contained no speech at all. There was no talking, there was no narration whatsoever. I simply played some music and then I layered some verses from the Quran and Hadith over the top of it. And that's all it was, verses from the Quran and Hadith copied word for word, listed one after the other. That's all. And a strange thing happened as a result of that video. A truly baffling thing happened. Muslims got apoplectically mad about that video, really furious about what they were reading. They didn't offer counter arguments or engage in theological discussion saying, oh, you misunderstood that bit, you've got that bit wrong. They just got furious. They were swearing, they were sending threats, they were demanding that video be taken down. In fact, eventually Facebook did take that video down and I got a warning for that one. And I remember thinking though, this is such a curious thing that Muslims, when they read their own holy books, they get angry about it. I just remember thinking, this is your holy book. Why are you getting mad at me for what you're reading? This is your book. And surely you've read this stuff anyway. I'm just quoting it to you. I mean, if people were quoting Jesus in public, I'd be delighted with that. I'd be so happy. And what I quickly realized is, and I think I knew this anyway to some extent, is that most Muslims don't actually read the Quran and Hadith. Most Muslims don't actually know what those books say. They really don't. Therefore, when it's quoted to them, when it's put in front of them, and it talks about Muhammad killing and torturing and taking slaves and being suicidal and all of those things, this is brand new information to them. And it's so awful to read that they assume, well, it must be a false smear. It must be lies. He must be making this up. It's just too horrible to confront the possibility that this is true. And this is why I'm so keen to emphasize in these videos that what you have been hearing and reading in this trilogy are simply direct quotations from the Quran and Hadith. And if when you read these verses, you find yourself getting stressed and it's causing cognitive dissonance and you don't want to believe it because it's just too terrible to contemplate, your problem doesn't lie with me. Your problem lies with the Quran and Hadith and with what Muhammad said and did because that's what those books say he said and did. And that's why I say rather than getting furious about it, simply go and check, research, look these verses up. Getting furious is just a cop-out really. It's easier than researching and confronting the reality of things. It's easier to put your head in the sand and try to ignore and pretend that it's not the truth. But it doesn't do any good to do that. Now some people will say, but the Quran isn't all bad because it has some peaceful passages in it too. And it's true, it does have some peaceful passages. The one that's most often quoted is chapter 2, 256, which says, let there be no compulsion in religion. You probably heard that one. So what are we to make of that conflicting message when elsewhere in the Quran, Muhammad says, and fight the unbelievers until there is no more unbelief and religion should be only for Allah. Those two passages don't seem to gel very well together. They seem to be at odds with one another. So what's going on here? Well. The Quran is essentially split into two sections, and those two sections correlate to two distinct phases in Muhammad's life. In the first phase, Muhammad was living in Mecca, which is his hometown, and he was trying to convince the Meccans, the Jews, and the Christians to accept him as a prophet by mostly peaceful means. It's true that during those years, he was mostly peaceful. Now, this part of Muhammad's life lasted about 13 years, and at the end of those 13 years, he had had virtually no success. He was trying to convince everyone that he was a prophet in the lineage of Moses, and Jesus, but he was roundly rejected by almost everyone, and he'd only amassed around 100 followers at the very most. Now, at the end of those 13 years, Muhammad was starting to get a bit more disruptive for the Meccans, and he was starting to cause some tensions for the town. 
they decided they'd had enough of him and they were going to capture him. So at that point, he had to flee Mecca. At that point, he went to Medina, about 500 kilometers to the north, and he essentially became a warlord from that moment onwards. From that moment on until the end of his life, which was about 10 years, he became this violent warlord that we've been hearing about in the previous couple of videos. He had a particular bitterness in those last 10 years and a desire to take revenge on the Meccans, the Christians and the Jews, those three groups who had rejected him as a prophet back in Mecca. And during those 10 years, as we saw earlier, he was almost never not fighting. That's when he was killing, he was raping, taking slaves and uh, torturing and doing all of those things. Now, all of the peaceful verses in the Quran come from the early Meccan years. All of the violent verses in the Quran that command Muslims to kill and wage jihad and you know, carry out torture and take slaves, they all come from the latter Medina years. So the Quran has a very split personality based on the Meccan years compared to the Medina years. Now, Islam works on a principle of abrogation, which simply means that where two passages conflict with each other, later verses cancel out earlier verses. And this means that all of the peaceful Meccan verses from the early years were later abrogated by the violent Medina verses. And indeed, the culmination, the very last chapter to be added to the Quran is chapter 9. And chapter 9 is the most expansively violent chapter in the whole book. This is the chapter that starts off by disavowing all the peaceful treaties with non-Muslims. It starts, this is a declaration of disavowal by Allah and his messenger to those who associate others with Allah and his divinity and with whom you have made treaties. So all previous treaties are disavowed and made null and void. Chapter 9 verse 5 then goes on to say, slay the unbelievers wherever you find them, seize them and besiege them and lie in wait for them in every stratagem of war. In 929 it says, fight the Jews and Christians until they pay the jizya and are utterly subdued. In 933 it says, Islam has been made to prevail over all religions. So the culmination of the Islamic message, the last word, the last command given by Muhammad to his followers is to disavow all the peaceful treaties and to go out and fight and kill and enslave until everyone is subdued under Islam and it's the only religion left in the world. These are the marching orders that Muhammad leaves Muslims with before he dies. And so while yes, there are these peaceful passages in the Quran, they have been abrogated and canceled by these later violent passages. The peaceful ones are essentially null and void. Jesus said, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends his rain on the just and unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you're kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And that's really the message that I want to end on here. I don't want anyone to respond in the wrong way to these videos. Without bending on the truth and without bending on our values, you know, Islamic teaching, Sharia law, the reverence on Muhammad, the oppression of women, all those things really have no place in Western society. And Christianity and Islam are not the same thing as we've so clearly seen in these videos. And also some people say that God and Allah are the same and they're not. But while standing for the truth and while holding fast to what we believe and while holding on to what's good and right and true and proper, our command from Jesus is nevertheless to love, to love our neighbours and to love our enemies, to show kindness and goodness to those who like us and kindness and goodness to those who dislike us, to love your enemies. That means to love Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, to love atheists, to pray for them all that they might find Jesus. Let's show the world what being a child of God really looks like. Let's love people hard. And as Jesus commanded us, without bending on the truth, let's love and pray for even our enemies. That's the only acceptable response for a Christian, for a child of God. Let's show the world how truly different and winsome and brilliant the Christian message really is.